It's great to be here again. Uh, it's good to have uh, you out tonight. Some of you back from holiday and uh, make you very welcome and welcome those joining us on YouTube in Leicester and around the world. Uh, who knows where they are? Uh, it's great uh, to welcome tonight Josiah, uh, our own Josiah, and uh, very um, privileged to have you, Josiah. We have been praying much for you. We thank you uh, for leading us tonight in God's Word. Uh, we had a great night uh, here last night. Uh, it was Girls' Brigade's uh, prize giving, and uh, it was uh, good to have parents in here in a good crowd and uh, much blessing. Um, God willing, uh, next week uh, uh, on Sunday, we'll be in uh, Mark 11, the uh, closing verses of Mark 11 and 1 Corinthians 6, and uh, chapter 6 in the evening. And uh, next Wednesday, God willing, we'll return to Numbers, uh, Numbers 15. Uh, I think we started figuring out numbers in January. We're still here. Uh, we've got a lot to do. Anyway, it'll be good to return to Numbers next week. Let's pray. Uh, loving God, we come to you, we thank you again uh, for this time when we can come together and have you speak to us in your word. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity later uh, to come corporately to thy throne and to bring our praise and our prayers, our supplication and our requests unto you, our gracious, loving Heavenly Father. We come to you tonight in the precious name of Jesus, uh, the only name under heaven by which men and women, uh, boys and girls, must be saved. The name above all names. We thank you for your great love to us. Blessed God, uh, one blessed Trinity, one God, three persons. We come to you tonight. We ask, Lord God, you would help Josiah, uh, help him, uh, grant him the help of thy spirit, grant him, Lord, uh, freedom and liberty to declare boldly what you have entrusted to him to declare to us tonight. We thank you for him. Pray you'd bless him. And Lord God, then receive us and help us. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. We're going to sing the hymn 58, uh, 58. Glory be to God the Father, glory be to God the Son, and the Spirit too. And we come to the triune God. Let's uh, stand and sing the hymn 58.
that rise up against me. Many there be which say of me, there is no help for him in God. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. And then I'd like to do another reading from the book of Jonah. A bit further on in the Old Testament, Jonah chapter 2. Now, I'm sure um, many of us know what, where we are in, in the story of Jonah. I don't really need to clarify that, but Jonah is in the fish's belly. We see that in verse uh, 1. So that's the context. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah, Upon the dry land. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of these ancient words, and we pray that you would make them live today uh, to us and give us understanding and give us the presence and light of your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, two men, David and Jonah, the two men who are followers of the Lord. So the two men who've got something in common with many of us here. But also they're two men who are followers of the Lord, but not perfectly. They disobeyed him. That's the context of both of these passages I've read. Men who knew better, but didn't live up to what they know, what they knew. In David's case, he's fleeing from Absalom because this is something down the chain from when he fell into sin with Bathsheba and all this stuff that's messed up in his life now, you can trace it back to his sin. Jonah is in a fish. We know why he's in a fish. Because God told him to go somewhere and he didn't go. So there are two followers of the Lord and two followers of the Lord, we would say today, Christians, who reap the consequences of not obeying God. But they've got something else in common. They're two men who cried to the Lord in their distress. And they're two men who found God to be sufficient for them in their distress. And here's the thing. They came to one conclusion. Their experience, their experience of sin, their experience of God's grace, crystallised for them one great truth. And they said... uh, Separate men at separate times, but they came to the same conclusion. You find it at the end of both those passages. What is that conclusion? 
Salvation belongeth to the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. And that's what I'd like to do this evening. I'm not going to look at those passages. We're going to go around the Bible a bit. But I want to look particularly at that idea. They've both given us a conclusion for us to think about. That salvation is of God. What does that actually mean? And what does that mean then in terms of you and me as we live our lives? To know that it is of the Lord. I mean, you and I hopefully are already trusting in him. So we would say, I have been saved. Past tense. So is that just a truth? Salvation's of the Lord. I can park that on the shelf because we did that when we got converted. And now we can move on to something a bit more uh, relevant. I want to look at this truth. And we're going to see, I hope this evening, that God is sovereign in salvation. And so I want to do two things. I want to look at what that means to say sovereign. We, sometimes we use these uh, bigger words which we don't use in general conversations. And it's good to think about them. What do we mean when we say that God is sovereign? And then once we've had a look at that, we're going to see how he's sovereign in salvation. So what is the sovereignty, the sovereignty of God? Now, if you break the word up, you get the word sovereign, and we know that a sovereign is a king or a queen, uh, a ruler, somebody with power, authority, somebody who sets rules, somebody who sets out a vision of how they think things should run, and also somebody who seeks to enforce it to those who would uh, disagree with them. And all those sovereigns in the world, whatever they are, whether it's uh, our queen or it's a prime minister or a president, whether it's somebody, uh, whether it's Putin or the, the chap in North Korea or any of these big heads of state, they're in a sense sovereigns. But they are like pale reflections, small shadows of the Sovereign with a capital S. In 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 17, this is how Paul describes God. He says, Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. From earthly sovereigns, to the king, the king of kings, sovereign with a capital S. So when we're thinking of the sovereignty of God, because that's what we're trying to get at, we're thinking about God's rule as king, his kingly rule in the whole universe. But the reflection, as we're thinking about these earthly ones, it's very, very pale, isn't it? It's very um, broken. We see such uh, something so fragile about the people in control. Now, uh, you might have seen in like a kind of maybe like a Western style film or uh, maybe even up in the neighborhood somewhere, some type of wanted poster. And if it's sort of the old Western style, you can imagine the the kind of cowboy hat and a dollar sign, something like um, $800, find this man. But you do see it around... You see little signs up sometimes, the police want information about um, this particular incident or have you seen this man? It does tend to be men, doesn't it? Um, And most of the time, you look at that sign and you walk away because you haven't got a clue and you carry on with your life. Or you've been shopping, you're in Lidl and suddenly there's a bit of a kerfuffle and somebody's shoplifting. What do you do? What do you tend to do? Well, you sort of stare and gawp a bit and then you carry on with your day. And that's what the staff do as well. They don't go racing down the road. What's the point? There's all kinds of rule and authority in place, but it can't be enforced because we can make all these rules and we can't enforce them. And... You can, uh, you can put all the boundaries in place, but the truth is, 
You and I have broken a few rules in our time and we weren't caught by the people who made those rules. It would be interesting to, interesting to see a statistic, like a table of how many crimes are committed each day, technically in the, in the UK, and then how many of them are actually brought to justice. And it would be vastly bigger on this side. Vastly bigger. What's the point? We have authority in this world, and it's so limited, so fragile. Kings come and go. We know that at the top, it seems you can have somebody in, in, in power, and then all of a sudden, they've been there for a while, oh, they've gone. They've been caught out in some scandal, they've resigned, somebody else is there. And everyone forgets about them fairly quickly. How often do you think about Gordon Brown? Not very often. He's gone. And, do you know, in, in five years' time, ten years' time, you won't be thinking about Boris Johnson. He'll be gone. But now unto the king, eternal, infinite, all-powerful, all-glorious, he will be still there. And he will still be sovereign. Earthly sovereigns have limited wisdom to see what really should be done. They can look and think, mm, we'll try this, we'll try and sort out this problem. But God has the wisdom to see the end from the beginning and know exactly what to do. Earthly kings have limited knowledge to find out every person who violates those rules. But God sees not just what you do, he sees the thoughts of your heart when you're sitting by yourself in your bedroom. He sees everything that we do and he can evaluate it and make a judgment whether it's good or whether it's evil. God has unlimited power to enforce what he says. And he has a rule which doesn't just hit the English Channel and stop. It extends all the way across the whole world. In fact, he rules in heaven, not just earth. He rules in the kingdom. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. He rules over the kingdom of darkness. Not that he's responsible, not that he is in, in any way uh, does, can have anything to do with sin, but even the things that the devil does, they're under God's control. Look at Jeremiah uh, 10, verse 10. But the Lord is the true God, he is the living God, and an everlasting king. At his wrath the earth shall tremble, and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. Think of the Old Testament time, think of maybe the map of Israel. You had the Israelite nation, they were in a specific place, and then around them, you had these other countries, the Philistines, the Moabites, uh, other times maybe the Assyrians, and they had their own gods. And the God of Israel, he was not just the God of Israel. His, if we can put it like this, his jurisdiction went to Israel, but he was actually the God who made the earth, the heaven, the sea, and so he had power over all those other idols as well. And that's why we get those stories. Like, you remember the story where Dagon, he was one of the pagan gods. They found Dagon flopped on the floor, I think, if I remember rightly. He had no power because the God of Israel could come into another country and do what he wants. And he's the same God tonight. He can do what he wants in Leicester. He can do what he wants in Moscow, and he can do what he wants anywhere in the universe. He is a sovereign God. Now, this is all big scale things. Jesus said that not a sparrow, didn't he? When you look in your garden in the morning, and you might see, if you've got a bird table, you might see a pigeon on that bird table. And the next day, you see two pigeons. That's because before the, the foundation of the world, God planned 
for you to enjoy a bird table and he sent those pigeons and he sent the robins. He also is in control, he's sovereign over the ants that you find coming into your kitchen and thinking, I didn't want them there. That's the sovereignty of God. It's the huge scale and it's the minute. But here's the thing where it gets uh, particularly pertinent. He's sovereign over your life, where you were born, who your parents were, how many siblings you had, who you met in life, the opportunities you had or didn't have, what you looked like, what unexpected circumstances came into your life. That was all in his plan. And there were no, in an ultimate sense, there were no accidents in your life. That's what we're talking about when we say that God is sovereign. And it even extends to this. Look at this verse in Acts 2. We know we have in the book of James it tells us that God um, cannot be tempted by sin and he doesn't tempt people. God doesn't tempt people to sin. The Bible is very clear about that. And we know that God hates sin. God is not responsible. There's no blame that we can put on him for sin in the world. But before evil men ever thought, that man Jesus, we're going to crucify him, it was in God's mind that there should be a cross before the Romans ever dreamt up crucifixion and before the Jews ever met Jesus and hated him. There's a mystery there. I'm not going to pretend to understand it or explain it. But I believe it, that God planned the cross before the foundation of the world, before there, were any, there was any sin, any people, before you or me. Acts chapter 2 and verse 22 just states it for us. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Why did Jesus die? Why was he crucified? Well, according to this verse, he was crucified because wicked men crucified him. And according to this verse, he was crucified because God determined that his son should come into the world and die. That's the mystery, that's the greatness, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the sovereignty of God. It's this big rule that encompasses everything. And if you're not a Christian, that would seem like a threat. If you're a Christian... That's wonderful, because that's your father that we're talking about. Now, if that's the sovereignty of God, what, I want, what then I want to look at, those verses we saw in Psalm 3, in Jonah chapter 2, what's the conclusion that David and Jonah came to? Salvation belongs to the Lord. And it's when we're thinking about God's salvation, that's the context we put it in in this rule of God, this power that can do what he wants to do and do it perfectly. And, one second, when we talk about salvation, we are dealing with not just salvation from sin and hell and from God's wrath, that's the big picture of salvation, we also want to think of it in terms of the details of our lives. Like Jonah, he was in a very bad place in his particular circumstance, in his life. And you will never be inside a, a fish, I don't think, needing, and you'll never be drowning in the sea um, expecting a fish to come. But you may be in dire straits, you may have been. And salvation is of the Lord in all those circumstances of your life. So, we see God's sovereignty and salvation in the timing of salvation. 
It's the first thing about salvation here. We see God's sovereignty in the timing of salvation. When's the best time to call an ambulance? You have an incident happens in front of you, there's somebody needing medical attention. When's the best time to call an ambulance? Right now. Yes? You do it right now. John 11, verse 6. In fact, we'll read from uh, verse 3. Therefore his sisters, that's the sisters of Lazarus, sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. That doesn't make sense to us by itself. But when we put it in the whole context of what we know about the story of Lazarus and what Jesus was doing and what that is meant to us today and the whole of the church for about 2,000 years, we say... It was good that he waited. It was good that Lazarus died. It was good that those two women went through that grief. Not because grief in itself is something to seek after, but we see God's wise, greater plan that takes in more information, more details, more, uh, just better in every way. It was better. That's how God works in salvation, according to his clock. Now, you see another one of this. If we turn to Psalm 89. Back in Genesis, there was a promise, wasn't there, that God would send a Messiah. Back in Genesis chapter 3, there was that early promise. And through the Old Testament, God's people know that there is somebody coming. And so in Psalm 89, for example, verse 3, I have made a covenant with my chosen, I have sworn unto David my servant, thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Well, that's good. It's very good. And it's a promise. It's a promise of God. It's trustworthy. And verse 36 of 35 Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. God is saying in his word, he's promised before, I'm going to do this. That's Psalm 89. But then what do we find later on in that psalm? This is the interesting thing. This is the psalm which gives us a definite promise that God's going to do something. And then in verse 38, But thou hast cast off and abhorred. Thou hast been wroth or angry with thine anointed. And so on, if you can follow those verses down. Verse 46, How long, Lord, wilt thou hide thyself forever? Shall thy wrath burn like fire? In other words... Lord, you've promised these things, and now I'm not seeing them. You've promised to send uh, good things to David. You've promised that there will be one on his throne. But our experience is very different. Had God forgotten? Had his promise wavered? Nothing had wavered at all. It's just that God's timing and his way, his thoughts are As high as the heavens are above the earth, so his thoughts are above our thoughts. He will keep his promises. He won't necessarily keep his promises according to your schedule. And in in history, we've seen that he doesn't do that. You know, I've heard uh, probably lots of times in my life, and I'm not knocking it one bit at all, I've heard Christians pray for revival. I think that's a good thing to do. But so far in my life, I've never lived in a time of revival. 
I don't have a sort of absolute guarantee that I ever will. But I do know there have been revivals in the past. I believe there will be revivals again. I might not see them. You may pray for revival all your life and die and go to heaven and be at rest and be at peace and be perfectly happy, but you didn't see revival in your lifetime, even though that was what you wanted. Does that mean that God failed you in some way? No. He did something better than the way you conceived history should play out. Now, I want to see revival. I may not. But what I will see, and what you will see in your life, is God's promises being fulfilled in his timing, in whatever way that means in your life. Now, if what I'm saying is true, then there has to be a time when everything is ready and God does do something and he saves. God keeps people waiting, but then there comes a time when it's like, now, now go. And in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, how long have people been waiting for the Messiah? How long have people been waiting to see the deliverance of Israel? When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, and so on. When the fullness of time had come. So, thousands of years go by. And then, on one day, one unexpected day, it was time. And the angel came and spoke to Mary. And then a bit later, down the line, on a particular day, a particular hour, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The time had come. And there's a mystery to that. But God knows exactly what he's doing. And you know, we are also looking for Jesus to come. It says in the book of Hebrews, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. And we don't know the day or the hour. We don't know the year or the decade. But he's going to come. And um, as in the days of Noah, so in the days of the Son of Man, people will be in, eating and drinking, marrying, and then one day, Jesus will come. Salvation is of the Lord in the timing of salvation. Well, what does that mean for you and me? It means these words which we find in Isaiah chapter 40. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Have you said things like that in your own life experience? Have you not known, have you not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Wait on God, rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. That's a message, by the way, which I am um, in need of very much myself. But I think you will probably um, be in need of it as well. Something Christians over and over again need to be reminded of is rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. His calendar is perfect. Salvation is of the Lord and will be exactly when he decides. Salvation is of the Lord in timing, and then in the method. Now, have you ever been uh, working for a boss and an employer and you've been doing a particular task in a, w a particular way, your way of doing it, and it seems like it's a pretty good 
way of doing it, getting the job done to your own satisfaction. And then the boss comes and says, no, no, you don't do it like that. Now, your natural reaction is what? You, you don't like that. We don't like to be told that our way is not so good. But the boss being the boss, you changed your method. You listened, even though you privately thought your, your way was better. And then down the line, you realised he knew what he was talking about. His way was actually better. His way was more effective. His way was wiser. When God saves, he does that all the time. He shows us a way which doesn't make sense to human wisdom. He uses ways and means of doing things that we would say, that won't work. And God says it works. And it's the only way that he is going to use, his way or no way. Joshua, chapter 6, verse 2. This is when the, uh, the Israelites are going to take the city of Jericho. Well, verse 1 says, Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valour. And you shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days, and seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. Is that a good military strategy? It's a very good military strategy. It's God's strategy. It worked. It doesn't make sense to us. But God's ways are best. They actually work. They do the job. And they do the job in such a way that all the glory goes to him. He does it in such a way that he shows, he shows how weak and how useless we are in, in ourselves and we have to rely on what he says. In the book of Judges, you remember Gideon. Gideon versus the Midianites. And what did God do? Well, he chose Gideon, first of all. And then when Gideon has his army, he cuts down the army. And then he cuts it down further so they have 300 men. And with 300 men, they're the ones... That's the way that the Midianites are going to be defeated. Was that a good strategy to bring salvation to Israel? It was an excellent strategy. It worked. Now, those are things from the history we find in the Bible. Where are we going? Well, salvation, all these small examples of salvation... We think of salvation now on the big scale. The world is lost. The world is plunging towards hell. People are dying. And there's no way that they can be saved in their own power. They need to hear God's message if they're going to be saved. What is God's message to them? God's message is to send his son and then to have his son be shamed and humiliated and hung on a cross and to be seen as a... It's, you know, if, if, some, if somebody was... If they brought back crucifixion, would you go and see it? Is it worth, a question worth asking? You wouldn't go and watch it. Public execution where you have people being um, treated in a brutal way and hung up would you go outside and watch a crucifixion? The point I'm trying to make is that the cross isn't a nice sort of um, devotional thing. Like we have, we have these um, nice sort of crosses we can put on, on an Easter card. Well, the crosses are empty on Easter cards. But you see the point. This is not a way in our thinking. This is not a way to attract people. But he says that... Um, he will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding 
of the prudent. Let's turn to that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is what pleased God. This is how he shows that salvation is of him. In verse 18 he says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. And then in verse 22, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Every single person who is saved is saved because of, through, in the cross of Jesus Christ. It works. The preaching of the gospel works. Our substitutes, our ways to try and make things a bit more palatable and, and just change the message so it doesn't be quite so hard on sin and not quite so blunt, and we wouldn't want to talk about hell and judgment or those things, we'd just change it a bit and just focus on a kind of vague, God is love, doesn't work. But the preaching of the cross, the bloody cross, the brutal cross, works. And men are saved, and women are saved, and they're rescued from hell. Salvation's of the Lord because the method was what God chose, what he set upon. It works. And if you are, are saved, that's why you're saved. And if you are not saved, but you are to be saved, there's no other way for you to be saved but through the cross of Jesus Christ. And finally, he's sovereign, not just in the timing but in the method, but in accomplishing. And I couldn't think of a good word for this, but what I wanted to simply say was, God does it all. That's what I mean by that. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. You and I have a name, and uh, some of us might have names which are a bit more unusual, but there are lots more people with your name. In Leicester, there are probably hundreds of Johns. There are other people, particularly in like sort of Hispanic cultures, who have the name Jesus. It seems a bit strange um, to us to, 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 to come across that. But the name Jesus means saviour. All those people who bear the name Jesus, they're not saviours. There's only one man who bears the name Jesus truly. Because the name represents him, and he is the saviour. He did it all. He did it all by himself. And we've seen a bit of that in 1 Corinthians. I want to finish by looking at a few verses from Isaiah. And this is, this, the, from Isaiah 40 onwards, you have many references to, to salvation in the book of Isaiah. And I want to just look at one or two of those. Look in verse uh, 12 and 13 of Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah 46 verse 12 says, Hearken unto me, listen to me, you stout-hearted or stubborn-hearted. Listen to me, you stubborn people. That's what he's saying. That are far from righteousness. I bring my righteousness near. It shall not be far off and my salvation shall not tarry, and I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. In Isaiah 44, verse 22, it says, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 10 the Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And then finally, Isaiah 45, verse 21. 
Tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have I, have not I the Lord? And there is no God beside me. A just God and a Saviour. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no one else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. What's the message of the Bible from, from cover to cover? Salvation is of the Lord in its totality. Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Amen. Let's sing number 135.